in our previous screencast, uh, we were talking about art in the Spanish Netherlands, or what we often call Flanders, the southern part of the Netherlands, the Low Countries, that you remember during that lecture, we had talked about the fact that during the Baroque period, this region was at war with the northern part of the territory, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, which is Holland. This was a religiously based war. Uh, the Spanish Netherlands was Catholic. Uh, the United Provinces were Protestant. And we refer to it now as the 80 Years War because it literally lasted 80 years. Uh, began in 1568 when the King of Spain sent in troops to stop an iconoclastic riot and did not end until 1648 with some breaks in the ongoing warfare. But it's worthwhile remembering that these two parts of the Low Countries were enemies, uh, at least politically, during the, uh, during the early part of the 17th century, during the first half. Uh, here we see an uh, image of uh, Dutch and Spanish warships uh, fighting uh, from exactly during this period uh, by Cornelis Verbeek. Uh, and this lecture will talk about Baroque Holland, 17th century Holland, uh, art that comes from these Protestant countries uh, outside, of, outside of Flanders. Uh, and there'll be some things that we see that are quite different here. Uh, in particular, um, because they're Protestant, there are no images of saints. We might have religious images, but they're primarily narrative scenes from the life of Christ or the Old Testament. But individual images of saints are, are much, much more rare. Now, this particular war decimated the finances of Spain. Uh, Spain went from being the leading economic power in all of Europe in the 16th century to being in incredibly poor by the end of the 80 years war. And at the same time that this happened, uh, what was fascinating is that in Holland, um, it led to the total dominance of the Dutch of, of seafaring trade. Uh, they became the masters of the high sea. And so here we see another picture of, of Dutch sea power, um, uh, painted by Albert Kaup, that shows a display of power, the amassed assembly of all of the Dutch fleet in the city of Dordrecht, one of the oldest cities in Holland. Uh, right around the time of the end of the end of the war, sort of showing off their muscle, just before uh, the Peace of Westphalia that brought about the end of the Eighty Years' War. This period, when Holland becomes the master of the high seas, Spain diminishes in power, is an era of incredible prosperity uh, for Holland. A period of expansion of trade. This is the the period of the Dutch East India Corporation. This is the period when the Dutch established the uh, colony of New Amsterdam, which is now, of course, New York. Um, and all of this prosperity meant that there was a very, very large uh, market to buy art. Uh, quite a few people could afford it because quite a few people were quite well to do. And in the 17th century, we find a new model for art production pictures being sold on the open market rather than by commission, almost exclusively, not entirely, but the majority of them sold on spec, produced by artists to be sold out of their shops. And for this reason, many artists actually specialized in, in particular kinds of art in order to corner a part of that market. And sometimes we even have multiple variations of exactly the same composition. Uh, which leads us to understand how artists were making uh, different versions of, of, a, of a popular composition uh, to be distributed more widely. One of the artists who was a specialist that we'll talk about is Franz Halls. Um, he was in the city of Harlem, after which the, uh, uh, the neighborhood in New York is named, although they dropped the Dutch double A uh, in the New York spelling. In the city of Harlem, which is really just outside of Amsterdam, uh, part of the uh, broader metropolitan region. The northern low countries, the United Provinces, were one of the most heavily populated areas of all of Europe at this time. And even to this day, they remain one of the most densely populated parts of all of Europe. Um, and with this dense population, we have a number of centers of art production, not just Amsterdam, which was the most prosperous city, 
and the largest city, but a number of smaller cities as well uh, were hotbeds of artistic activity. And Hulse is in one of them in Harlem. And in his work, he did almost exclusively portraits, not entirely, but almost exclusively portraits. And all of his figures focus on the human uh, actors uh, in close up. And one of his great strengths uh, in all of his pictures is uh, the sense of characterization, the liveliness he's able to bring uh, to the people who sit for him or any of the scenes that he does. Um, her face, for example, we don't know who she is. Um, it tells us how old she is and when it was painted, but it doesn't give us her name. Um, it, it, but you can see it, she's full of wit and vitality. She looks like a, like a hoot. She looks like the ant at your family reunion that you would want to hang out with because she's got really good stories and is probably going to dish pretty hard on, on the people she doesn't like. And she's, she's got smile lines around her face, you know, everywhere you look. Uh, this is not a woman who frowns. This is a woman who jokes and laughs. Uh, and you'll notice as uh, we look at the picture that Franz Hulse depicts her in this chair, turning toward us and, and obviously very, very pleased to see us. And uh, if you look at her hand, you'll notice that she grips the side of the chair because she's about to stand up to say hi to you. Um, and all of this adds to the sense of spontaneity that the work has. Um, it just seems so vibrant uh, and so full of life. Um, and you can also see, if we look at this detail, also go back and look at her face. Um, Franz Hall's paints in a way that looks as if it's um, spontaneous, as if he... He didn't spend a lot of time on it, as if it were sketchy still. And this is uh, certainly an illusion. He spent quite a bit of time on these pictures. But uh, what it adds to is this sense of vivacity, uh, this sense of liveliness uh, that makes the port the sitter seem really almost alive. In her other hand, she holds a small personal Bible for reading. And again, we can see the sketchiness of, of Franz Hall's brushwork, these little flecks and lines that we see uh, on, on her hand, on her thumb. Uh, she is a member of the most dominant church. Uh, we presume she's a member of the most dominant church in, in the Low Countries, which were uh, the remonstrant strain of Calvinism, the followers of John Calvin. And this is important for us in, uh, in understanding Dutch art because um, the, the Calvinist theology is built around restraint, is built around the idea of not showing off, uh, not eating too much, not drinking too much, showing restraint in your personal life. And for this reason, Dutch people in the public wore very, very simple black clothes uh, to show their, their restraint. They're not very flashy at all. We might find some flashy military uniforms, but on the norm, we see people dressed in, in very simple uh, black clothing. Um, that said, uh, within these social boundaries, there was some room for conspicuous display. For example, the lace pattern uh, that we see on her sleeves around her headdress. Uh, these allow for a, a certain uh, uh, flamboyance, although within that restraint. Uh, we can also see, if we look more closely at her costume, how well embroidered that is as well. Uh, covered with little designs, but it's black on black. And Hulse is really good at painting black. Um, hundreds of shades of black, which is really incredibly difficult for artists, right? Uh, and of course, then there's that, there's that amazing rough collar, that exquisite collar that Hulls paints with great detail. These are the areas where Dutch costume allowed for a certain flamboyance, but on the norm, uh, Dutch costume, Dutch clothing was, was very, very restrained. What we see with this portrait is, is Hulls' own, own strength, his own specialty, uh, characterization, liveliness. These are what he does best. He also does paintings of everyday life, not portraits per se, although they kind of seem like portraits, but rather uh, just scenes of people who hanging out in bars, having a drink. The jolly drinker or the jolly toper seems to be turning to us to offer us uh, a drink that we might join him. He's ready, ruddy cheeked. He's 
already deep into his cups. Uh, like our elderly woman, his, his, his lips are parted. And he acknowledges us. He's happy to see us. There's a really wonderful spirit um, in a lot of Dutch art, a uh, very down-to-earth and very um, humane spirit. But our, our Jolly Toper is, is, is probably just a scene of everyday life, probably not a portrait per se, uh, and certainly adds to this, this appeal uh, that so much Baroque art has, an appeal to our senses, an invitation to participate. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell whether they're portraits or genre scenes. Uh, this smaller picture of the National Gallery of a young man in a large hat could be uh, a genre scene like the Jolly Drinker, or it could be a portrait as well. You'll notice he's leaning kind of around the back of the chair. He seems to come out through that porthole. And again, uh, happy and engaged and, and absolutely delighted to see us in the same way that it's absolutely delightful to look at. Uh, this is, I think, our first woman artist, Judith Leister. She was working in Harlem at the exact same time as Franz Halls um, and may well have studied under him at one point in her career. Uh, her handling of paint has that same loose and sketchy quality that we see in Franz Halls' work. And her approach to the subject matter is the same sort of vibrant, uh, happy, uh, feeling. She too, like Franz Hals, does both portraits and and scenes of uh, of revelers, like our drinker, like our young man in a large hat. Uh, here is a self portrait of her, um, and you can see that she's laughing as she paints. She has her mouth open. Uh, we can see the top row of her teeth beneath her lip. Uh, she leans on the chair to stop her work because she's happy to see you. Um, as you've come to visit her. Uh, what's interesting as she paints is that she's, she's dressed wholly inappropriate uh, for the activity. Uh, she's wearing very, very refined clothing, that beautiful purple sleeve, the red uh, dress down below the skirt that we can see. But look at that collar, that amazing lace collar that adorns her simple black outfit. Um, Certainly not the sort of thing that you would wear while painting in oil paint, where the paints don't dry right away. You run the risk of, of ruining that very expensive piece of clothing. So again, why is she dressed this way? Well, this is what we saw with Velazquez, is that she's interested in proclaiming the importance of being an artist, that uh, artistic activity is uh, a refined and... Uh, nearly aristocratic pursuit. It gives her a lasting glory. Uh, and in fact, we see her painting the kinds of pictures that she was known to have painted. And here we see one of her paintings, uh, these uh, revelers making music together and having fun, but again, taking the time to acknowledge her presence. You get to join them. And in this particular case, over at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, uh, we see Leister in a self-portrait, singing along with these two men who are painting. And you can see that the structure of the face, the overall layout of the lute player on your right, is very similar to the violin player um, in her self-portrait. These are the kinds of works that she was uh, famous for. We think that um, her self-portrait was probably painted for the uh, Painters Guild in Harlem. Uh, where she, as, as a presentation piece to show her skill, uh, a masterpiece, as she became a master painter. Now, certainly her, her concert image is, has the distant influence of Caravaggio, a very similar theme to the sorts of things that Caravaggio was painting and other artists were copying. Leister never, ever went to Italy, but at the same time, she's picking up those influences as they filtered their way back to the Low Countries through other artists who had gone and seen Caravaggio pictures. Um, as we mentioned at the outset, uh, the strong economy in Holland during the 17th century led to a, a huge number of uh, patrons for the arts, a number of art buyers, and this again led to artistic specialization. So whereas Leister and Franz Halls did these scenes of revelry 
um, as a particular specialization, sort of genre scenes of, of people having fun. Uh, Van Goyen, Jan Van Goyen, was in fact uh, exclusively a landscape painter. That's all he ever did were landscapes. And in fact, landscapes seem to have been the most popular kind of art in Holland. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that Holland was a new country. And oftentimes when we see countries newly independent, we see an interest in sort of emphasizing what is particular, what is new, what is different or unique about that country. And uh, landscape is a perfect way to do that. Uh, in other words, their newfound independence led to a sense of sort of national pride. Um, here, the city of Dordrecht uh, was in fact a major shipping port. And we see the busy, it's a confluence of two different rivers, um, that estuary out into the ocean. And uh, it, we, we see here the sort of the busy port and the old church in downtown Dordrecht. Uh, it was also, as I think I mentioned before, one of the oldest towns in all of Holland. So it certainly is a symbol to the people of Holland of, of their great heritage. Uh, in fact, there are ruins in Dordrecht that go all the way back to ancient Rome. Uh, it's that important to the, to the people of the Low Countries. And the paintings of it, these 20 different paintings that Van Goyen does, uh, are certainly had an appeal to... Uh, to the Dutch as, as a symbol of, of their legacy, their power, their history, um, all tying into their, their newfound sense of, of national pride. In addition to national pride, um, uh, this idea of the land, or in this case, the sea, is very, very important because, um, like I said, there was a new boundary with Flanders that was being drawn at exactly this time. Holland was newly independent, and so the land came for them uh, a very important metaphor for independence and identity. But at the same time, and this is why I'm showing you this detail on the left, is that land was being reclaimed from the sea as well. Holland, as it became increasingly independent, started to put up a series of dikes and use the windmills on top of those dikes, not only to mill grain, but also to pump water out of the uh, low-lying lands and into the sea. So that really about a third of the dry land that we see anywhere in, in, in Holland is land that, had, that used to be underwater. And it was only through crafty technology and the use of windmills uh, that Holland had more arable land for crops, but also uh, to develop and expand their cities. So uh, the land was for them a very important metaphor. Not only are they a new country, but they actually are living on new land as well that their own technology had reclaimed from the sea. All that said, there's also a certain joy in observing everyday life in this busy port city. We see ferries that are uh, traveling in and out of the city. They're delivering people from the boats. The Dutch were great with boat travel uh, between the different pot, uh, centers of population. Uh, navigating these inland waters and the ships, uh, the sailboats can only go so far. So low draft ferries like the one we see here would take uh, the people from the, the crowded transport boats and into the dock of the city. Uh, so in this case, we see these people being ferried to and from the different sailboats uh, and, and then taken back to shore. Uh, then the sailboats could sail on to other other Dutch cities. At the same time, we have sort of scenes of everyday life. There's a man in the lower left corner who I believe is um, working the eel traps, uh, capturing uh, eel fish for, for foodstuffs. The Dutch love their eel. Um, it's quite good, actually, it's, even though we don't think of them as such because they're, they're too much like snakes. Another landscape specialist uh, painted exclusively landscape pictures is Jakob van Rausdahl. Um, and this one simply titled Landscape. Uh, again, makes multiples of the same composition to be sold to the open market. Um, these were the cheapest kind of painting to, to buy in Holland. And that made them the most widespread kind of paintings. Almost everybody seems to have owned a landscape painting. And we see them inside Dutch interiors in paintings from the period all the time. And again, uh, this Dutch pride in the land. This is our country. 
They wrote poems about wandering through the landscape. And here we see a woman with her child going off to market with their faithful dog, the dog pausing on the bridge as they cross over the waters and uh, uh, proceed on a pathway that leads back behind uh, those three trees that take up most of the composition in the center. Uh, there were quite a few poems written about wandering through the landscape and saw this wandering as a, as a time for reflection. As you look at nature, you think about your life. As you walk through the landscape, you think about life's progress, about the pilgrimage of life. And certainly, I think that Rouse Dahl's picture uh, picks up on some of those same themes. So if we think about the metaphor of crossing a bridge, uh, a bridge over rushing water, um, that, that certainly is a, is a powerful uh, symbol for the passage of time, uh, for life as uh, the movement from one chapter to the next as, as we move our way through life. Uh, and I think that's the theme that Van Rousdale is working with here, uh, the passing of time, uh, a wander through the landscape as, a, as an allegory for a, uh, our movement through the years of our lives. Uh, we have water crashing over uh, the rocks, eroding them as it cuts its way through. This is entirely fabricated on Van Rousdale's part. There are no waterfalls in Holland. It's flat. Uh, water doesn't rush and rage, water meanders its way through. Uh, but we also see here uh, another metaphor for the passing of time is this, this broken tree branch um, laying in the foreground, right? The, the, the clouds, you know, move through. Time seems to be passing uh, in front of us. And as we think about this idea that the landscape is this metaphor that we ponder and we think about life's passage. If we look at the path that the woman and her son are on, you can see nestled in the darkness, if you spend enough time looking, uh, there's a fellow coming toward them as well. You can maybe make out his legs as he's walking in their direction, but entirely cast in shadow, a dark stranger in the woods. Could he perhaps be a, a metaphor for the dangers um, on life's pathway, the dangers that might await us? One last bit of allegory to look at with this picture are the three trees on the hill. Uh, and you'll notice as you look closely at the three trees that the one on the left is dead. Uh, the one in the middle is broken. And you can see the broken branch to the right of this detail. And the one on the far right is thriving and healthy and hardy. Uh, again, this is life's passage from health through decrepitude to death um, as we read them right to left. At the same time, we might also think of these uh, three trees on a hill as being a metaphor for the crosses on Calvary, where Christ was crucified between a good thief and a bad thief. Uh, and certainly when we look at the poetry from the period that talks about wandering through the countryside, one of the things that people are exhorted to reflect upon uh, is their own religious salvation, to think of God's creation in the landscape and see it as a, a strong uh, 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 presentation of uh, you know the wonders of nature as 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 God revealed to us, and I think Van Rousdal is picking up on that. Another specialist in 17th century Holland is Willem Kleissen Heide, William Heide, the son of Kleis Heide or excuse me, son of Will Kleiss. Um, he uh, does nothing but still life pictures. And we have a really wonderful banquet piece. Sometimes artists would do only breakfast pictures, sometimes pictures of uh, broader banquets. And what we see here is in no humans whatsoever, but the aftermath of an incredibly wonderful dinner, uh, right? The people have left the table off to something else. And we see what they've left behind. The linen is all bunched up. Some of the containers have been knocked over. Uh, bits of food left uneaten. Uh, and this is an important part of the theme of this picture. It's that Calvinist idea of restraint. 
uh, not everything has been eaten. The plates haven't been licked clean. There are little bits of food that have been left. There's little bits of beer that have been left. Uh, that for all of the food that we see here, the sumptuousness of this meal, uh, the people who have eaten it have, have shown restraint, which is in perfect keeping with the religious tenor of the time in 17th century Holland. The main dish, which we see on the plate back here, is a mincemeat pie. This is a very exotic delicacy. Uh, it's made from local currants, really, really strong flavors, spices imported from the Middle East. It's not cheap. Um, it's so rich that it's hard to sort of eat too much of uh, without sort of having your mouth kind of go crazy. Um, and it's usually only served on holidays or at very, very lavish banquets. And uh, so this is a very expensive, a very special meal, but it's been left unfinished. The spoon still rests on it, as if you could come up and take a bite. Uh, this, again, that Baroque interest in, in engaging you, the viewer, and your senses uh, in, in what we're looking at. There are other exotic elements here that add to the luxury of this meal. Uh, this gilded bronze goblet in the back with a little carving of Neptune, the god of the sea, at the very top. Uh, a finely decorated silver basin in front of it, uh, where it's been upended so that we can see the, uh, the relief decorations on the bottom of the basin. A very expensive goblet next to that, leaning against the stem of that silver uh, uh, basin. Um, a very, very delicate and refined decanter from Venice, which is probably full of vinegar, which is what you would have had with your your mincemeat pie. But it's important to remember, and Hayter reminds us of this, that life is short and life is precarious. Uh, we see, for example, a snuffed candle in the back left corner. Uh, we see here a, uh, a, a crystal uh, goblet precariously balanced on that silver uh, basin, and I think it's already cracked as well, uh, lying here. So uh, life is, is a, a, a dangerous, uh, dangerous thing. That danger is picked up by the way in which some of the plates have been arranged on the table by the artist. Uh, we see the lemon peel dangling over the edge. We see here a plate with oyster shells on it, a little uh, funnel used for salt uh, to flavor the oysters, and a broken goblet on that. And it's almost as if whoever left this table hasn't learned their lesson. That glass has already been broken uh, because of the fragility of life, or as a symbol of the fragility of life. But in addition to that, uh, they leave the, uh, the plate still precariously balanced over the edge of the, uh, uh, of the table. Uh, equally imbalanced is this other silver plate with the two buns on it and a knife that's there to cut the, the bread uh, to enjoy the meal. And you'll notice that like the handles of Caravaggio's uh, violin, it's extended toward you, the viewer, so that you are uh, encouraged to, to take part in this sumptuous, elegant meal. Uh, oysters, mincemeat pie, other imported objects, uh, other imported foodstuffs like the lemons, like the olives. Uh, this stuff is not native to Holland. This is an expensive meal, but our diners have shown restraint, uh, which is again a key element of Calvinism. Other artists in Holland specialized in genre scenes, scenes of everyday life, which we've seen uh, beginning around 1500 and then spreading really throughout all of Europe. Uh, Jan Vermeer was a genre scene specialist. The vast majority of his works are these images of everyday life. And within that overall theme of genre scenes, Vermeer more particularly specialized in images of women 
usually alone, not always, but usually alone, caught up in uh, the psychology of their everyday activities, wrapped up in their thoughts as they go about uh, not so much chores, because they're not working, they're the ladies of the house, but rather just their activities in and around the domestic environment. Uh, he finds within this idea a, a number of different possibilities. And you can see that in each of these images, the overall layout, the overall composition is really quite similar. Something square in the upper right corner, the window off to the left, the space blocked by a table that takes up quite a bit of the space, and the woman sort of set up against this geometry of shapes. That's so typical for Vermeer. Uh, and our work is, is really one of the very best examples. In the National Gallery picture, we can see a woman uh, weighing her jewels to check their value. She's got her jewelry box open. There are pearls and gold chains there. She has a set of scales, or excuse me, a set of weights on the table, and she's holding the scales um, as she's about to weigh her possessions. We've seen before that this is a very poignant uh, genre theme, and one that usually carries a very, very strong moral about uh, where one puts one's priorities, uh, in the things of this earth, as she might be, or in the things of heaven. Uh, but you'll notice that she is not actually weighing anything yet. She's getting ready to. She's actually checking to see if the scales are balanced or not. There's nothing in either of the two pans on the scale. So she's simply checking to see whether or not this, uh, this is a scale that she can use to weigh her objects, and who knows, at this moment she might decide this is not the right thing to do and put it all away uh, and, and, and really choose that higher road, that better path, uh, uh, those proper priorities of, of, of life's more important things than monetary uh, value. That said, you'll notice that on the wall there's a mirror, and you can tell it's a mirror because of the reflection that comes off of it. This is before people put paintings behind glass, and you can see there's even a reflection on the bottom of the, of the uh, frame. So uh, this is, again, the idea of self-reflection, of, of looking at yourself and understanding yourself, and maybe she's going to look up and see her reflection, and think about what's important in her life, and put those scales away. Uh, Vermeer leaves it ambiguous, though, and this is one of his great strengths, is the ambiguity he often gives his pictures, because the mirror here might suggest vanity, except that she's not looking at it. Um, the mirror might ref suggest reflecting on oneself, but again, she's not looking at it. One of the things we know about Vermeer is that as he worked on pictures, he would make changes. He'd do a drawing on the, on the panel to begin with, and then he'd work it up through various layers and making slight alterations to get this sort of perfect harmony of shapes that we see in these different images. And uh, in doing that, as he made changes, one of the things he would often do would be to paint out details that he originally had included, details that would add a very specific meaning to a picture. And he would change his mind and, and paint those out, uh, change those. And, and he hasn't made many of those changes here, but he does leave it somewhat ambiguous as to exactly what is the moral reading here. He gives us a lot of clues that could point toward this idea of proper valuation of one's things, but at the same time, he doesn't really tie it down to make it any obvious, uh, very obvious. Uh, what's interesting uh, as well is that that picture on the wall behind her, we can actually identify the picture. Um, it's an image of the Last Judgment by a 16th century, late 16th century uh, Dutch painter. Uh, Vermeer actually collected works by that artist, and he probably owned this picture. And this is the moment when uh, Christ separates the saved from the damned, and her head is uh, in, directly in front of that picture, and right below the feet of Christ, who appears in that light spot at the top. What is particularly fascinating about this is that her placement uh, against that picture puts her head right where 
uh, St. Michael would normally be as he weighs souls to determine the good from the bad. So she really almost takes the place of St. Michael in her last judgment, uh, which again gives us uh, material to work with as we think about the meaning of the picture. It doesn't tie anything down, but it certainly does make it uh, that much more interesting. Another genre specialist, uh, and probably someone who knew Vermeer, they definitely knew each other's works, and they probably were friends as well. They're working in the same city, but Peter de Hoek uh, also specialized in scenes of everyday life, uh, like Vermeer did. And sometimes he would do isolated women, uh, like Vermeer did. Sometimes their works looked very similar to each other, but this one looks quite different. Here we see a woman uh, uh, in an upper class, upper middle class household, a very comfortable uh, house with multiple rooms. They're not rich, but they're doing quite well. Uh, and in fact, you can see it's a very, very clean house. Uh, the woman on the right is in the action of, of making up the bed. It's a little inset alcove bed behind her. You can see a landscape painting uh, hanging on the wall above the door. And the little girl has come in, uh, presumably her daughter. Um, and there's this wonderful interchange between the two of them. Is there any moral here? That's a little bit harder to say. And I think that there is, but at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's intentionally vague. Uh, intentionally less direct than our Reformation era works had been. So here is uh, the mother uh, airing out the sheets, making up the bed. There's a chamber pot um, on, on the ground. Uh, the interior is meticulously clean, uh, no dust uh, anywhere. The light spills in from outside through the mudroom that in fact isn't muddy. Um, as the child has come in to surprise mom. Um, here's our kid. She has a ball in her hand. Uh, she's been out in the backyard playing kolf, which we talked about before when we looked at uh, some images of ice with Peter Bruegel, that early Dutch variation of golf where you whack a ball across a flat surface to try to hit a pin. And she's come in from her little game, and she wants, I think, mom to come and join her. These pictures are definitely set up to, for the viewer to read narrative into them, to think of the story that might be involved as we look at this scene of everyday life. Again, notice the realism uh, here, the wonderful play of light across the surfaces, the polished tiles in the mudroom behind her, uh, the more earthenware tiles in the room that she's standing in, the way the light reflects and refracts across the different surfaces through the windows is absolutely spectacular. Um, uh, again, there's a mirror uh, on the left wall, very much like Vermeer's mirror. Uh, again, reflections as a, as a symbol for thinking about what's important, and that should maybe clue us into wondering about a moral uh, to the image. And I think this, is, this one probably is fairly straightforward, but at the same time, it's not going to get in the way of it just being a wonderful scene of everyday life. And in this particular case, I, I wonder if the, the moral isn't this idea that there's a time for work and there's a time for play, and that the children get to play, but the, the adults have to work. And the child has this interplay with her mother, who's smiling down toward her, but she's uh, she wants mommy to come and play, but mommy can't. Mommy's got work to do. Uh, certainly, the Dutch found great virtue in domestic activity and saw these kinds of works, uh, if done well, to reflect a good character. And this is, a, this is the house of a woman of good character. Everything is where it should be. And uh, even those things that aren't like the chamber pot soon will be put away. Uh, the bed will be made, and this is a well-kept house because she doesn't goof off. Nothing wrong with goofing off, but there's a time and a place for everything. Any overview of... Dutch Baroque art, Baroque art in Holland, would be incomplete without discussing Rembrandt, uh, the single most famous artist from 17th century Holland. He spent his entire career in Amsterdam. He moved there when he was 22. Um, here we see him significantly later, about 30 years on. He's about 53. 
in this picture, and as you can tell, he's had something of a, of a tough life. Um, Rembrandt, as an artist, is stands apart from the other Dutch artists we've looked at, whereas most of our Dutch painters specialized in one kind of image, uh, de Hoog as a genre painter, Vermeer as a genre painter, Rousdal and Van Goyen as landscape painters, Hals and Leister as painters of revelry, um, Hals as a portraitist. Well, Rembrandt really decided he was going to do everything. He was going to paint all different genres of painting. And he, he saw this as his way towards success, his pathway towards success, was to paint uh, uh, all different genres, all different kinds of painting. And so we have uh, many, many different pictures by Rembrandt and his studio, also made prints, which we'll talk about as well. Um, our color scheme and the off-camera dramatic lighting here show that Rembrandt is definitely influenced by the works of Caravaggio. At the same time, he never traveled to Italy. There's a good chance he saw one Caravaggio that was sold in Amsterdam during his lifetime. But the majority of his interest in Caravaggio came through seeing other artists who had copied his style, other artists who had traveled and brought back this innovative Baroque style of Caravaggio, even to the Netherlands. So again, it's a second-hand Caravaggisti, Rembrandt is. He didn't see the works firsthand probably that closely uh, and really was able to get most of the influence from seeing other artists who had, who had looked at his works. Now, this is a self-portrait. Rembrandt did a huge number of self-portraits uh, throughout the entirety of his career. And it reflects his single great strength as an artist, which is his ability to capture the humanity, uh, the deep sort of passionate humanity of the people he depicts, even here himself, to characterize the figure. He's not just sitting, but there's a sense that in looking deep into his eyes, you can understand uh, the psychology uh, of the sitter, that you get to know him better. Uh, with this wonderful detail on the right, you can also see Rembrandt's amazing sensitivity to the medium of paint. Um, he applies the paint in a way that follows the sagging skin of his face. Even as he paints himself here at 53, he doesn't try to make himself more handsome than he is. Than he, is. He, he gives us the sagging jowls, the lines around his eyes, and he had had a fairly tough life, uh, most of it uh, by his own design. Uh, but he does seem pretty prematurely aged here. His one bow to vanity is, is the hat. He was most likely bald uh, by this point, and in his self-portraits, he almost always appears with a hat on, and all we see is the sort of bozo hair, uh, clown hair off to the sides uh, that he let grow out. As I said, Rembrandt did a huge number of self-portraits throughout his entire career in different media. Here's a print uh, of a self-portrait uh, frowning. And... The reason he's doing so many self-portraits is not necessarily egotism, but rather he's using his own face, looking into the mirror, um, as a way to uh, capture and study different kinds of expressions. And the point of this is that Rembrandt wants eventually to become a history painter, a painter of historical scenes, of biblical scenes, because this is where the money was. This was the best, they were the most expensive kinds of painting, and they were the ones that the... Uh, the critics said were the the most important, the best kind of painting to do, and that's what Rembrandt really wants to do. So studying his own features gave him the ability to sort of tell historical stories, biblical stories, and tell them well because he understood expressions, facial expressions, and how those different expressions could give uh, different meanings. These self-portraits are absolutely wonderful. I, I'm quite in love with this one, this very, very tiny print about the size of a postage stamp. Uh, where he's looking into a mirror and going, ooh, and studying his face as he does so. Uh, so again, this interest in his own face, uh, in the different sort of expressions of his face, is part of his attempt eventually to become a history painter. And as he moves to Amsterdam, he also does studies of other models in costumes that he began to collect, uh, sort of exotic, and Amsterdam is a huge port city, 
allowed him to uh, collect different kinds of clothing, different kinds of jewelry, costume jewelry, and he would clothe people in these and make these large-scale pictures. This is about four, four and a half feet tall, so the figure is roughly life size. Um, and he would do these just as studies of costume, so that when it came time to do uh, historical scenes, he would have this visual encyclopedia of of facial types, of expressions, of costumes, where he could just, without posing people, uh, compose from from his memory, because he had made all of these wonderful paintings of of figures in costume and paintings of studies of, uh, of facial expressions. Here is one of Rembrandt's later uh, religious pictures, a religious narrative, a historical picture is what they called them at the time. And it's the moment when Christ is taken to the temple to be circumcised. And we see uh, the Virgin Mary there, uh, Christ in her arms, and the, uh, the rabbi intently about to uh, circumcise the infant Jesus. And what you see on the left-hand side is the results of Rembrandt's study of characterization, the study of costume, where we see uh, the Jewish priests in the temple uh, off to the left, all exotically garbed in things that Rembrandt had studied throughout his career. And now when it comes time to paint uh, this scene, he, ha he has a backlog, he has a visual encyclopedia, uh, usually in his memory that he can draw from uh, and, and simply uh, sketch out these clothes. Uh, from his mind. Here's a print where we see the same issue, where the different people are gathering around Christ to be healed, and Rembrandt is able to characterize them all uh, by gesture, by facial feature, and by costume. Uh, they're really sort of fantastic uh, uh, narratives that invite you to dive in deep. So here's Jesus. This is the moment when um, after preaching on the Sea of Galilee, the sick and the dying come to him to be miraculously healed. So we see off to the right a gent being brought in on a, on a wheelbarrow, a lame woman at his feet, a young woman climbing up to bring her child for Christ's blessing. And this is the moment when Peter tries to stop them. And Christ says, uh, pushes him aside and he says, uh, allow the little people, uh, allow... Uh, the children to come unto me, uh, suffer the little children. Uh, this is in Matthew 19. And again, gesture, facial features, expressions tell this amazing story. I love the fall of light of the shadow of the praying hands in the detail and how they fall directly onto Christ's robe here. Um, off to the left, we see uh, the people that have been gathered around him. Um, there, with his head in his hand, uh, to the right of our detail, is the uh, the rich young man who can't decide whether he could give things up to follow Christ. A dog in the foreground has has, has dropped his ball or rock, hoping that someone will play for it with him. But of course, there's more important things to do. And again, these costumes and, and gestures and facial features, uh, the Sanhedrin up above debating uh, whether or not this is proper for Christ to be healing people on the Sabbath. Um, and again, uh, Rembrandt has this backlog, this uh, catalog of, of, of facial features and costumes that he can trot out um, and use uh, in these images at will. The medium here is new. This is printmaking, which we've seen before, but this is not an engraving. Um, instead, this is an etching. And etching is a very different process, relatively new in Rembrandt's time. Um, you still use a metal plate into which you will carve a design, but the, the process requires you to lay a thin ground of a wax-based substance over the entirety of the plate. And then instead of actually carving the plate manually like Durer had done, you scratch through the wax. Uh, you scratch your design into the wax. So here's an image I found on the internet of uh, an etching plate uh, where the artist is in the process of scratching the design through the wax ground that covers the entire plate. Um, you then take that plate and you immerse it in a, 
in a bath of, of relatively weak acid. It would certainly harm your eyes. You wouldn't want to get in your mouth. Ideally, you use gloves, but you can use your bare hands, and if you don't have open wounds, it won't remove the skin from your flesh. But it does eat copper very well. And so the lines that uh, Durer, for example, had to carve with a sharpened burin, uh, the acid does the work for Rembrandt. And it allows him to have a sort of sketchy approach to, to printmaking. And he loves printmaking. He has over 300 different etchings by Rembrandt. And in all sorts of different media, in this case, a, a, a biblical scene. Here is a landscape print by Rembrandt. Um, he also made landscape paintings. We have, in fact, one of his very few landscape paintings at the National Gallery. But uh, in this case, again, in this etching, we see, uh, uh, well, in both of these, we see sort of Rembrandt still sort of channeling Caravaggio light, that high, highly dramatic lighting, and sort of creating with the lattice work of of lines, of etched lines, an amazing sense of tone. Um, and his landscape picture is, is certainly full of charm, full of wonderful details to look at. There's a fisherman at the left with his wife next to him. He's got his line out into the gentle stream that flows by. As our eye wanders to the background, uh, we see a farmer in the field with cows, and we can see how, how terrific Rembrandt is as a draftsman. Uh, capturing poses, but also animal anatomy absolutely perfectly. And then in the background, we see the city uh, against the flatness of the Dutch landscape. Windmills, churches are the only things that rise above the horizon line. Off to the right, we see a cart moving across the landscape behind the trees. And far off to the right, a tiny little detail, we see an artist uh, sitting on the hill sketching. Uh, Rembrandt often includes people out drawing in the landscape like he himself might well have done. Um, and this is a sort of a fascinating image for Rembrandt because the artist is looking toward the sunny horizon and the storm has just passed behind him. And it's again very easy to project uh, narratives into this image how the storm has passed, he's weathered, looking forward to brighter times. Um, in 1643, uh, Rembrandt's wife had just died of tuberculosis after being bedridden for three years. Um, and it's, it's interesting to think of this psychologically as Rembrandt looking forward to brighter days as the storm clouds have passed. At the same time, it's also interesting to think about reading uh, biblical metaphors into the three trees. We saw this with Van Rausdahl's painting as well. In this case, the trees don't give us living, broken, and dead. They all seem to be thriving, but still the idea of three trees on a hilltop uh, would remind people of trying to find God in the landscape, uh, looking for metaphors as one wanders through the countryside. And as we think about finding things in the landscape, Rembrandt gives us a reason to look more closely. And it's a little hard to see in this detail. I tried to brighten it with Photoshop to make it more clear. But in the shadows beneath the trees, while our artist is looking toward brighter things, we have a couple uh, snuggling in the woods. Um, and you can maybe make her out in profile. I'm gonna try and sketch her here. Um, so here's her head, here's his head. He's got his arm this way. She's got her shoulder here and sitting this direction, right? And now I'm going to erase the ink so you can see them better. They're in the bushes doing naughty things. Uh, they're canoodling down here. So uh, again, the landscape presents for us uh, something to ponder, something to look for, um, and to spend our time uh, with uh, thinking about uh, higher things, but maybe also thinking about uh, more base activities as well.